In this episode, we're talking about the social justice standards from Learning for Justice and how we can embed them into our goals in the language classroom. I'm joined by Cécile Lenny, a French teacher in Tennessee, who helps us to see the importance and benefit of integrating these social justice standards into our curriculum goals beginning at the novice level. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom Podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and as always, I am incredibly happy to have you here. And thank you on behalf of your colleagues and your students for taking the time out of your week to listen to what teachers are doing and to think about your teaching. It's what makes you a wonderful educator. So thank you on behalf of everyone who benefits from your work. So real quickly, before we jump into our topic, I want you to look down at your phone, make sure you are subscribing or following whatever the app's asking you to do to make sure that you get these episodes every Monday when they come out. You can even leave a little rating or review there that might be helpful as well. So now we're going to jump into our topic for today. And we're going to sort of do this combination of, yes, we have our proficiency, can do actful stuff. But we are in a world now where we are embracing this idea of social justice. It's something we should have always been doing. But now we have opportunities to make it the focus of our classrooms. So we are going to be joined today by Cécile Lenny, who is going to help us sort of navigate and embrace these social justice standards to use in our classroom. Now, as you could probably tell from Cécile Lenné's name, uh, she is a French teacher, and she's actually in Nashville, Tennessee, which is awesome. I love that. And uh, she's uh, currently teaching middle school. She's been teaching for about 12 years in Douzendani, as we were saying earlier, um, having a little conversation in French before we started. And you may have seen her name around uh, because she's often at conferences. You might have seen some of her YouTube videos and on her blog talking about movie talks and all kinds of great stuff like that. That's why I've connected with her. But you can you know, see her out there in the world at Actful or IFLT, Comprehensible Online. And of course, I always like to give a shout out to those state organizations. So her Tennessee state organization, which is TWLTA. I think I got that right. Uh, they always, we always love our acronyms in the language teaching world. So hello, Cécile. Bienvenue. C'est un plaisir. C'est un plaisir. It is such a pleasure to have you with us today. Bonjour, je suis. Ça va? Oh, ça va très bien. Ça va très bien, très bien. So I would like it, it to hear just a, a little bit more uh, about you uh, beyond the very specific details that I gave. Well, a little bit about me. And for the purpose of this conversation, I am a white, cis, heterosexual, body-abled, and neurotypical woman. I was born and raised in France, and that's, you mentioned my my name, Cécile Lenné. It's got two accents in it, and I'm very, very attached to those. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But I immigrated to the United States in 2000, and I became American in 2012. Um, And I'm also part of a beautiful, multiracial, multicultural family. Uh Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, The... uh, being proud of the accents on uh, our names, so much part of our identity. Um, Being a Canadian, being a Canadian myself in Quebec, if you're driving on the highway and you see the exits for the different towns, the towns sometimes are 
five to seven words with hyphens between them all. And there's a lot yes. of pride and the number of hyphens in your town name. <laughs> you know, so to exactly. say them. So I see the, the pride in the accents and we have the pride in the hyphens in our town names. You know, the little things, the little things. There we go. We already connected. <laughs> So now let's jump into this conversation with the social justice standards. And I particularly appreciated how you introduced yourself by putting yourself in the context of what your lived experience is. And that's such a wonderful place to start. So thank you for doing that. So let's look at the learning for justice standards. And before we talk about using them and the benefits of them, can you talk to us about sort of what these social justice standards are and how they're set up or designed? Absolutely. And first of all, I am not an expert in those social justice standards. I am someone who is trying to, very hard to practice and learn as much as possible. Um, so the social justice standards are produced by Learning for Justice, which you might know is the new name for teaching tolerance. They consist of, it's a big framework because it's K to 12. So it's a framework with uh, four pillars or four domains, identity, diversity, social justice, and action. Okay, so you have four domains. And in each of the domains, you have five standards And student outcomes. So student outcomes are kind of the behaviors or the skills that we want our students to exhibit. So, for example, inside of the identity domain, which is the domain that I work the most with at the middle school level, because at that age, constructing your identity is really important. So that's why we made it a focus. An example of standard is students will express pride, confidence, and healthy self-esteem without denying the value and dignity of other people. So that's one of the identity standards. And the student outcome specifically for a sixth to eighth grade student is, I feel good about my many identities and know they don't make me better than people with other identities. Okay, so there's this concept of it's identity is not one thing, it's, multiple, it's multifaceted. And then there are people with which I'm gonna have things in common, and things that are going to be different, and none of that makes me better. So there's a lot to unpack just in that one. I hope that gives you a good example. Uh, I just want to point out for everyone that's listening, I'm going to have a link to the document that Cecile is referencing as we're going through, so you don't have to go Googling around trying to find it. It'll be in the show notes for that. And as as you're looking at the the different domains, I'm when I first looked at these, Uh, There's something that we've embraced as a school and a department this year as well in my school. And I particularly appreciated how it is broken down by level. So I believe the the beginning, it's sort of a pre-K, an elementary, an early elementary. It's it's K to two. Yeah, it's usually Mm -hmm. two to three years. K to two, three to five, six to eight, nine, et cetera. Very age appropriate. Yeah, and it's sort of it 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 grows sort of developmentally. It's such a useful document because of the language that's so developmentally appropriate. It's the same standard, exactly. but using language that's very developmentally appropriate. I appreciated that design of it. So now, when we take these social justice standards and we want to use them in our classroom, there's often this idea that oh, is it two separate things? Is it teaching language? Or this, we've we've kind of gotten to a place where we understand that language and culture are mixed. Like, yes, we definitely embed culture. But then there's some ideas that, well, this is too big of a topic. We have to kind of separate it from our language teaching. It's important enough to do, but we have to combine it along with our proficiency in our classrooms and our language as well. So how can we take these standards and sort of use them along with something like our can-do statements. Yeah, and first of all, I, I, I do want to say that it's, it's not just a matter of looking at the standard and boom, here I go, I integrate it. Um, Learning for Justice also has professional development, which we spent the whole of last year with my department going through to really unpack each of the domain and each of the standards. And then we picked 
the standards that for our age groups that we wanted to focus on. So at the middle school, we picked identity and diversity. So I think that's, that was something really important to, to say. But to your question specifically of, you know, how do we embed this with our Akfal Kendu statement? I think they fit beautifully with the Akfal Kendu statement because it gives us a purpose for language acquisition, right? So when you look at the, uh, the Kendu statements and even the intercultural uh, statements, it's like you're acquiring this language so that you can communicate so that you can identify products and perspectives or products and practices that help us understand perspectives. And you can interact at the survival level. I'm, I'm quoting the novice type um, statements here. But, you know, I, if I may cite uh, another podcast that I follow, We Absolutely. Teach Languages. Thank you. <laughs> it's We Teach Languages, which is produced by Stacey Johnson. Um, and episode 142 Dr. Jonathan Rosa was interviewed by Dory Conlon Pierugini, and he asked this very, this question that just made it so compelling for me. He said, multilingualism in service of what? Connected to what vision of the world? So again, this was by Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan Rosa, an anthropologist, and that really clicked with me. Okay, interacting with others for what purpose? What's, what is the vision of the world that I want to promote in my classroom? And, and not just in my classroom, but outside of my classroom. So to me, it is, I want to increase empathy and I want to reduce bias and, and prejudice. And so now I can teach language with that purpose. And so that's what the, the social justice can do statement help us do. They provide that purpose. And the uh, just the your reference to the intercultural can do statements, you know, so we, you know, going back seven or eight years before we had these intercultural, it, the can do statements are very just linguistically based. Even with the arrival of the intercultural can do statements, we're able to really dive into culture and purposely embed it into our language. So this is sort of the next step in that process, yes. you know, and uh, and bring those all in together. Exactly. So now that we have a pretty solid understanding of what they are um, and why they exist, I and everyone, I'm sure we would we would like to start to just look at what that looks like in your classroom. You know, when you are engaging with this mm -hmm. with students and let's, you know, talk specifically about the novice level, because I think when you're looking at the level fours and the AP, it's sort of, oh, yeah, we yeah, we take those on. Those are the AP themes. But it's something we might shy away from sort of at the more novice level. That's really why I wanted to have this conversation with you, because I think that doing this work this such, such important work at the novice level is a place where you have a lot of guidance on. So what does it look like in your classroom with novice level learners when you're engaging these social justice standards? Again, for your listeners, I'm a work in progress, but this is where I am right now. So as I told you for our middle school, for fifth and sixth grade, we chose to focus on expressing pride, confidence, and healthy self-esteem without denying the value and dignity of other people. And so how do we bring this to life? We've implemented um, an identity journal as a capstone project for the end of sixth grade. And we went to someone who has been doing a lot of work in that area, Francoise Tenou, who is the teacher behind mm -hmm. the handle, the work Spanish teacher. She has a wonderful identity journal in French and Spanish. Uh, we adapted it to, uh, to our students, to the level of our students. And it's very simple. It has a page for each different characteristics of identity. As we mentioned before, identity is very complex and multifaceted. So you have things like your name, the languages you speak, your religion, the food you eat, uh, the, your traditions, your pronouns. It has all kinds of different things at a very simple level. And we don't rush through it. We use the end of sixth grade, that last quarter, to go and, and you use those topics and, and have our students enter their information in their journal. And it's very personal and they can illustrate it. It's very age appropriate. And we piloted this last year 
And now we are in backward design mode where, okay, based on the pilot that we did last year, these are the language element that we were missing because we didn't have those, maybe all of the conversations that we had to have. For example, mm -hmm. religion wasn't something that we were talking about in fifth and sixth grade. So we've designed uh, a lesson on the, a very simple novice lesson on the five major religions in the world. And when I ran that lesson, my fifth grader said, this was the most interesting lesson we've done all year, literally fifth grade, because we kept it very simple. We kept it also to the level of what do those religions have in common? Well, they all we, they all go to a place of worship. You know, they all have a sacred text, things like that. And also what made it really powerful is we did not exoticize those religions. We talked about those religions as they are practiced in our community. So in Nashville, so I had pictures of a mosque in Nashville and a Hindu temple in Nashville, etc. And in fact, the only Christian church picture that I had in that lesson was in South Africa, because I really wanted to flip, you know, that what my know my fifth graders come in with, which is, you know, all those religions are happening outside of our community. And in fact, no, it's they're happening inside of our community. So that's the kind of work that we're doing with our with our little ones. Um, another example is um, you, the use of inclusive language. I know a lot of teachers sort of shy away from using that because they are afraid that it's going to confuse the children. And that, that's not been my experience. With the little ones, fifth and sixth grade, um, we also create imaginary characters. So we we, which is something that a lot of comprehensible input teachers, CI teachers do, you know, we co-create characters together. And I was always wondering, okay, if somebody asked me, why do you create characters? I would answer, well, so that I can teach them descriptive language. You know, they learn how to say tall and small and blue eyes and, and green eyes. But now if somebody asked me, why are you teaching? Why are you co-creating imaginary characters? I say, so that I can show them that the French language is very gendered and that we can make space in this gendered language for all kinds of gender identities. And so the, one of the first questions that my students ask me when we design a character, so let's say we have this beautiful snail, is it a boy or a girl, right? And I just, it's a natural question. And I answered naturally, well, we don't have to choose. And that's how I introduce Yel, which is our gender neutral pronoun in French. And that becomes a, just a very natural, very embedded way to, to live and breathe this social justice statement of, you know, expressing pride and not denying the value and dignity of other and just normalizing it as part of our creative process. I hope that those are two examples that resonate with you. Absolutely. I have a couple of questions about them sure. uh, because I'm thinking, how am I going to do this in my class on Monday? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it won't be on Monday, Joshua, but... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm but thinking, okay, little identity little. journals. We need to start, like, what is this going to look like? <laughs> so I'm curious now, when students have their identity journals... Do mm -hmm. you have any opportunities for them to engage with each other's rather than is it just is it something that's personal to the students or do other students use them to look at and learn about their classmates? That's a great question. So when we piloted it last year, um, we told them this is personal. This is your identity. Um, because there are some pages that students are going to leave blank. And then there are some pages where they're going to spend a lot of time because they're so excited about that, right? Like, what do I eat kind of page, <laughs> you know? So last year we left it like that, that, you know, it's your personal journal. Um, but you're absolutely right. We, the next step, we want it to be, what are you comfortable sharing? And, and what are you not comfortable sharing? You know, we, we want this to be a place where it could be a joyful exchange, but not put anyone on the spot and certainly not out anybody for anything. So we're, we're working that, that line right now where we have to decide. And I think probably the, the way to do this is to let the students choose which page are you particularly proud of and you want to share with someone else. And that's how I think we're going to take the next step as opposed to now show us your entire identity no because you know some of those elements are mine and i don't need to show them for your convenience um, but what am i proud about what do i want to interact with you about i think that could be really powerful indeed i forgot to cite an incredible source um 
for inclusive language, and I want to make sure I correct that. And that's Chris Nisley um, from the University of Arizona. He has a wonderful website, uh, chrisnisley.com, with very simple infographics to help us French teacher you know, embed inclusive language in our teaching. So I used his resources a lot. Yeah, that's, uh, it's very helpful. Um, I've actually referenced that myself. I mentioned that the other domain that we want to focus on at the middle school level is diversity. So at the seventh and eighth grade level, we are focusing on diversity, the domain of diversity. And our uh, standard is, or is, I can respectfully describe ways that people, including myself, are similar to or different from each other using novice language. So now we're really getting into, I'm going to use some of my language to describe people and to really make those very rich comparisons, right? And so with that, we have different entry points. One of them is holidays. You know, Mm -hmm. that's something I used to think of culture as Francophone culture only. But now, you know, and thanks to Zaretta Hammond, after I read... um, um, culturally responsive teaching and the brain, I, I realized, wait, culture is not just Francophone culture in my classroom, right? So holidays celebrated by our Jewish students, by our Muslim students, you know, what? how do we make these visible as well using novice language? So now I have quite a little collection of very simple presentations about key holidays in, in various religions and always, uh, always, as usual, trying to anchor this in our local community as much as possible so that students don't walk away thinking this is a holiday that people celebrate outside of the mm-hmm. United States or outside of Nashville, right? So holidays, I think, is a really important one for diversity. And then the other one is when we talk about Francophone people, I used to present Francophone people a, a very, re- very simplistic version of Francophone people as convenient for what I was trying to teach. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. I was almost treating the Francophone people that I was presenting to my class as commodities so that I could teach certain chunks of language. So a very recent example, it, it actually hit me this week when I was working on a Francophone person with my seventh graders, how much progress I have made. Um, we were talking about Angélique Kidjo. And you may have heard of her. She is a, a complete icon. She is from Bénin. Uh, She's a singer, entrepreneur, and activist. And when I used to present her, I used to just focus on the fact that she spoke French because, hey, she's a Francophone person. But this year, I expanded and I just said, you know, she speaks five languages and three of those languages are West African languages. And we went and looked at the map and looked at where those languages are spoken. So I, I... instead of reducing her to this Francophone person that speaks French, <laughs> I really made her identity, uh, uh, tried to, to, to be truer to her identity and to present the, the, the diversity of languages that she's singing. And we even listened to one of her songs in Ewe um, that she sang for the uh, Le Centenaire de la Première Guerre Mondiale, the, the celebration for the First World War, which was in 2018 in Paris. And she sang in Ewe, which is a, a language from West Africa. And so we listen to that song. So how much more powerful is that to present a person with her full identity versus just reducing her to this person that speaks French? So that's another example that I wanted to bring. Yeah, I'm thinking of the, the idea of uh, intersectionality, which is coming up that basically yes. speaks to that. You know, if we, if we just focus on that single identity, like she's Francophone, then it's very one-dimensional. You know, whereas with the uh, intersectionality, we're able to bring in, like, everybody has multiple identities. You're not just a uh, a female, but you are a African female. Uh, you are not just an African female, you're an African female who has this type of family, you know, and so you have all these different identities that are going in. Absolutely. And in fact, I think I had the definition of a Francophone wrong. It's not just somebody who speaks French, actually. Most Francophones are multilinguals. And that's it. We just have to change the definition that we have for Francophone and embrace all those other aspects of our mm-hmm. the Francophone identity. So in, in looking at these standards, uh, the social justice standards, and bring them into your classroom, uh, I, I appreciated how you, as you were saying what the students can do, 
that you mentioned the language that they'll use to do it, which is not part of the standards, but as a language teacher, you take that and you overlay <laughs> onto it that, oh, this is the language you're going to use to do that. I'm happy that you mentioned that because I think that there is often, as I mentioned at the beginning, this understanding or even fear that you really can't have these important necessary conversations in the target language because you just need so much robust language to talk about it. So for teachers who may have that belief that these social justice topics require advanced proficiency to engage with them, so they have to do it in the native language, what's what's your advice for them based on the way you're going about it? I have, I think two answers. Number one is these topics are not necessarily social justice topics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the topics that I have presented as examples, uh, you know, looking at someone, a Francophone person who's made an impact, that's not a social justice topic. But the way we are going at it is with a social justice lens, which takes a, a little bit to develop. And, and we have wonderful people, and I have cited some of them and resources, learning for justice, obviously, to help us do that. But it's looking at your topics that you are teaching right now with a different lens. So for Angelique Kijo, she's not just this person that speaks French. I want to uncover the rest of her identity. And I'm doing that because now I'm looking at her with that different lens. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part of the answer is you don't necessarily have to find a social justice topic. It's, it's the way you approach you, you approach your topics that I think deserve reflection and change and, and, and you know, a lot of progress. And then the second part um, of the answer is we start with the language that our students can understand and the, the language that they have. So, for example, when we look at Francophone people, we start with what do they look like? You know, the color of their hair, color of their eyes, the color of their skin, what do they wear? And at some point, there might be questions that arise, and we might have to address those in English, and that's okay. So, for example, um, we, we talked about Bilal Hassani. He is a French singer. Um, his origins are from Morocco, and he has become... <laughs> Whether or not he wants it, he has become a queer icon. And so he was the representative of France for the Eurovision in 2019, I believe. And when, I, when we talk about Bilal Hassani, I have pictures of Bilal. And I do picture talk, a very novice-oriented technique where I present a photo and together we describe what we see. The first picture, he is wearing a, a wig blonde wig and he has makeup and he has a t-shirt the second picture he has a different kind of wig with long hair and he has a beautiful blue dress and then the third picture he's wearing his natural hair with glasses and a shirt and so as I'm putting those pictures and we are describing together using very novice language this the questions start emerging from the students the questions and so the questions usually are wait is this the same person Wait, is this a boy or a girl? Wait, is he gay? Right? So we have all those different questions that come up from the students. All I do is present pictures. And from the questions, I can answer to the best of my of their abilities and mine in the, lang the language and sometimes in English. So, for example, um, one year I had to stop and explain, yes, exactly, this is what we call being queer, do you know what that means? And the, the student said, no, does anybody know? A student had a partial definition. And then I, I tried helping with the definition and that was in English. And then we moved on and back to French. And so it's going in and out using our like <laughs> translanguaging type skills to go in and out of novice language back into a little bit of English and coming back into it and just following the the curiosity, the natural wanting to understand, uh, you know, instincts that our students have and not shying away from those conversations. So that's the two part answer to your question. I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it's very insightful and it's based on your 
direct experience having done it, which is more useful than any theoretical suggestions. So no, thank you. And sometimes when you talk about your personal experience, you you talk about the details. So thank you very much for that. So as we kind of move on a little bit from this conversation, I would, we've learned so much from you. <laughs> and I, you're clearly a person who's inspired by so much around you. And where does your inspiration come from? Where does, like, you get up and you're like, I want to do this even better today than yesterday. Where does that inspiration come from? Honestly, my my family. I, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that I I, li- I live in a multicultural, multiracial family. And so I I have no choice but to really dig deep into my identity and the identity of my family members, you know, I, because that's my experience. And so I, I think that's the source of constant wanting to do better for, for my daughters, for my husband. And then, of course, then it expands to my students and, and my local yeah. community. So I'm curious, within your family, what are the language, the languages or the language that happens as you all communicate? From a language standpoint, it's mostly French and English. Mm-hmm. Uh, my husband is is bilingual in Spanish. He's from Costa Rica. Unfortunately, he does not use his, his uh, language a lot inside the home. Um, but I do use my French. And so we, uh, we definitely translanguage a lot between oh, okay. English and French. And sometimes there's a couple words in Spanish, but those are the two main languages. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now uh, this is the point in our conversation as we sort of start to land the plane. This is our initial descent (laughs) into the airport. (laughs) Uh, Oh, that's too bad, but yes, I understand. (laughs) Uh, My little fun activity game I like to call this or that, so we can get to know Cécile uh, a little better, uh, pulling the teacher curtain by back a little bit. And so I'm just going to ask you this, this or that questions and just give us some insight about how you would answer that. Maybe say why. Okay, here we go. First one. Are you one to arrive early or to stay late if there's a lot to get done today? And can you say both? <laughs> I Yeah, I'll allow it. <laughs> I, I make the rules for this game so I can change them at any time. Oh, you do. <laughs> Um, unfortunately mm-hmm. both, because if I have a lot to do, I'm going to be waking up really early and start thinking about it and can't go back to mm-hmm. sleep, unfortunately. Uh, and then I'm probably going to stay late or come home and then work oh, late on okay. it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good insight <laughs> there. Do you enjoy cooking? Yes. Okay. So this is a good question for you then. Are you more of the cook that cleans and tidies as you go or do you wait till you're done i let my husband do it (laughs) um no i clean i i clean after i'm done i'm not a as you go person (laughs) there's a big Mm -hmm. mess yeah you stay in the moment in the creative moment in the moment yeah and then i involve my kids and my husband to clean afterwards (laughs) and one last one uh if you're at a museum of sorts and there are interactive exhibits, and there are exhibits where you're going to appreciate the artistic value from a distance. Which one are you going to gravitate towards? The artistic value from a distance or the one where you're going to interact with it? It's funny because you're describing French museums and, and American <laughs> museums. Um, and so having really lived both, I see value in both, okay? But I think I'm going to go for interactive. The American Museum. Yeah, really. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're going to go to the Centre Pompidou? (laughs) Oui, Centre Pompidou is an example. (laughs) But it's an exception (laughs) to the rule, right? (laughs) (laughs) If given the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. You can either go to the Louvre if you're hanging out in Paris or the Centre Pompidou. Yeah, you're going to go to the Centre Pompidou. That's exactly right. (laughs) (laughs) So I am sure that there are teachers listening who would love to continue to get insights from you, share ideas with you. And what's the best way for teachers to connect with you? I am on Facebook and a lot of professional networks and Facebook groups like CI Mm -hmm. for French teachers, French teachers in the US, things like that. Um, I'm also on Twitter more than I want to be because I follow those amazing people who are only on Twitter. So, <laughs> so you can also connect with me on Twitter, though I am not there as, as much as I am on Facebook. And I also have my okay. website, obviously, towardproficiency.com. 
where you can get in touch with me. Okay. Well, I will make sure that all of your social media handles and your website are in the show notes so that everyone can connect with you that way, along with the uh, social justice standards that I mentioned earlier that we went through so everyone can access that right away. So before we say our final au revoir, is there one last really just kind of actionable piece of advice that you can leave with teachers as they are considering taking on these social justice standards in their classroom? I'm going to say, start with yourself, do your own, you know, unpacking. And that's an advice that Francoise, the woke Spanish teacher uh, often gives. So I'm going to credit her for that and use those resources that have been designed by people who are further along on this journey than you are, like Learning for Justice. As I mentioned, there are professional developments that go with, with each domain that are very easy to, to go through. So if it feels really daunting, start with that. Start with people who have done this work and, and that, are, that are generous with their time and resources. And then once you have made progress, then credit back. Make sure you amplify these people and these resources. Thank you for all of the insights and just helping us to see that it's it's really about taking this lens and putting it on our teaching as as our starting point and making it very actionable and manageable to take on uh, what can be challenging approaches to teaching. So thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup. Merci à toi, Josué. Okay. Thank Au you, revoir. Joshua. <laughs> Au revoir. What are your takeaways from that conversation with Cécile Lenny? I particularly appreciate how well she's able to show us that we can and should implement the social justice standards beginning at the novice level and building from there. Be sure to check out the show notes to connect with Cécile. You'll also see the link to sign up for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. There are also links to get in touch with me if you would like to work together, either in person in your school or remotely. Talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com. <laughs>